Number 10. Carl Jung and the Scarab Psychologist Carl Jung introduced the concept of synchronicity. Causality is what connects one process or event to another, where the first is partially responsible for the second, and the second is partially dependent on the first. If events occur with no causality, yet seem to be meaningfully related, this is considered synchronicity. The most basic definition of synchronicity would be a meaningful coincidence. In his book Synchronicity, Jung gave this example of a synchronous event. Jung was treating a young female patient whom he considered to be psychologically inaccessible. The problem was that the woman was too rational, and thus he could not get her to open up. Jung wrote, After several fruitless attempts to sweeten her rationalism with a somewhat more human understanding, I had to confine myself to the hope that something unexpected and irrational would turn up something that would burst the intellectual retort into which she had sealed herself. One day the woman was telling Young about a dream she had had the night before, in which someone had given her a golden scarab. While she was telling him about the dream, Young heard something gently tapping on the window behind him. He looked and saw a large flying insect banging against the window, obviously trying to get into the room. He opened the window and caught the insect in his hand as it flew in. It was a large scarab. He showed it to the woman and said, Here is your scarab. According to Young, the event had the desired effect of breaking her intellectual resistance, and he was able to treat her from then on. Number 9. The Plum Pudding French poet Emile Deschamps wrote in his memoirs about a bizarre coincidence he had experienced. As a child in Orleans in 1805, he had been given a gift of plum pudding, by a man named Mr. de Foncabou. Ten years later, he was in a restaurant in Paris and saw plum pudding on the menu. He decided to order some, only to be told by the waiter that the last piece had just been sold to that gentleman sitting over there, who was, of course, Mr. de Foncabou. Years after that, in 1832, Emile was at a party where plum pudding was served. He recalled his earlier coincidence with plum pudding to his friends, and he joked that the only thing missing was Mr. Defoncabu. Just then, the door opened, and Mr. Defoncabu walked into the room. He was by then an elderly man and suffering from dementia, and had wandered into the wrong house by mistake. Number 8. The Twin Tragedy In July of 1974, 17-year-old Neville Eben was riding his moped down a street in Hamilton, Bermuda, when he was struck and killed by a taxi. No one was found to be at fault. It was just a terrible accident. One year later, in July of 1975, Neville's younger brother, Erskine, who was then 17 years old, was riding the same moped down the same street when he was struck and killed by the same taxi, which was carrying the same passenger that had been riding in it when his brother was killed the year before. Number 7. The Two Novas Scottish astronomer Archie Roy was at his office in Glasgow University when a man he didn't know, who had the unusual name of Mr. Melchisedek, phoned to tell him that he had discovered a new star, possibly a nova. Archie decided to phone the university observatory to confirm the discovery, and when a colleague answered the phone, Archie said, I've just got off the phone with a Mr. Melchisedek about a nova. There was a silence and his colleague replied that that wasn't possible, since Mr. Melchisedek had been with him for the past half hour discussing the Nova, and he hadn't phoned anyone. After everything was sorted out, it was determined that there were two Mr. Melchisedeks, and that one Nova was a star, while the other was a brand of computer. Number 6. The Chris Benoit Premonition On June 24, 2007, Canadian professional wrestler Chris Benoit was slated to wrestle CM Punk for the ECW World Championship at WWE's pay-per-view Vengeance, but was replaced at the last minute by Johnny Nitro. On June 25th, an anonymous user edited Benoit's Wikipedia page to read, Chris Benoit was replaced by Johnny Nitro for the ECW World Championship match at Vengeance, as Benoit was not there due to personal issues, stemming from the death of his wife Nancy. Fourteen hours later, police in Peachtree, Georgia, 
discovered the bodies of Benoit, Nancy, and the couple's seven-year-old son Daniel in their home. Benoit, who had been suffering from premature dementia due to his high-impact wrestling style, had murdered his wife and son before committing suicide. Police were able to locate the man who had made the edit, who was in no way involved with the murders, and who explained the edit as a huge coincidence, nothing more. In another coincidence, the man was a resident of Stamford, Connecticut, which is also the location of WWE headquarters. Number 5. Codell's Twisters Codell is a small, unincorporated township in Rooks County, Kansas. On May 20th, 1916, in the early evening, an F2 tornado passed just east of town, destroying farms but causing no fatalities. Exactly one year later, on May 20th, 1917, an F3 tornado passed west of town, also in the early evening. Like the previous year's tornado, farms were destroyed, but no one was killed. Exactly one year after that, on May 20th, 1918, an F4 tornado passed directly through Codell just after dark, destroying buildings and killing nine. No tornado has ever struck Codell or Rooks County on May 20th before or since. The odds of the same small town being struck by tornadoes on the same day three years in a row has been estimated at several billion to one. Number 4. Sorry, right number. In 1967, Essex policeman Peter Muscardi was working the night shift. His friend would sometimes call him on his break, and when the station changed its phone number, Muscardi mistakenly told him that the last four digits were 0166, rather than the actual number, which was 0116. A few nights later, as Muscardi was checking on a factory that had been left inexplicably unlocked and lit, he answered a ringing phone to discover it was his friend. The factory's phone number was the incorrect number he had mistakenly been given. Number 3. The Lone Gunman the Lone Gunman was a short-lived spin-off of The X-Files, starring Mulder's three conspiracy theorist friends. Today it is mostly remembered for its pilot episode, which first aired on March 4, 2001. In the episode, a hacker working for a major arms dealer takes control of the autopilot system of a passenger airplane with the intention of crashing it into the World Trade Center blaming it on a Middle Eastern dictator, and thus selling more arms to the government when they go to war. Needless to say, when the 9-11 attacks occurred just over six months later, those who had seen the episode were shocked by the synchronicity. Number 2. Dennis the Menace On March 12, 1951, Hank Ketchum's Dennis the Menace comic strip debuted in American newspapers. Across the ocean in the United Kingdom, on the very same day, British cartoonist David Law first published a comic strip featuring his most famous creation, Dennis the Menace. There is no indication that either man knew, or had any way of knowing, that someone else across the world was working on a comic strip of the very same name. No lawsuits were filed on either side, each man amicably continued their separate comics, and both characters became popular with their respective audiences. Number 1. The Erdington Murders On May 27, 1817, 20-year-old Mary Ashford was found raped and murdered in a sand pit in Erdington, England. A Mr. Thornton was arrested and charged with her murder, but after two trials, he was acquitted due to a lack of evidence. Exactly 157 years later, on May 27, 1975, 20-year-old Barbara Forrest was found raped and murdered in almost exactly the same spot. Her body was found in a ditch roughly 300 yards from where Mary's had been found. A man, whose last name was also Thornton, was arrested and charged with her murder, but was acquitted. Mary and Barbara, besides being both dark-haired, fair-skinned 20-year-olds, also shared the same birth date. Furthermore, both victims had been at a friend's house to change into a new dress to go out to dance on the night of their murders. Even stranger, both had apparently had some kind of premonition about their death. The week before her murder, Mary had told a friend that she had bad feelings about the week to come. 
Ten days before her murder, Barbara had told a colleague, This is going to be my unlucky month. I just know it. Don't ask me why. Neither woman's murder has ever been solved. Thanks so much for watching today's video. Hopefully you found it interesting. If you did, please give it a thumbs up, check out my other videos, and subscribe.